So good morning and welcome to our annual result presentation. Thanks for joining us here in Zurich or online. We appreciate your interest in our company very much and look forward to an exciting two hours. Before I start with the presentation, I would like to share my deep appreciation and thanks to our organization, the 33,000 employees, which I have the privilege to, to lead. And I also stand here on behalf of all of them presenting our joint uh, collaborative achievements in 2023. I believe it's a strong uh, statement of uh, the power of the organization, what we can do, and we go into the detail as we go. But it's not me. It's all of us uh, in, in the company, some of them are here in the room, also here a big thank you for organizing just a perfect setting to, to guide us through the next uh, hours here. It's a people company and uh, our people have made tremendous uh, uh, achievements possible in the last uh, 12 months and also going forward. Now, going into 2023, I think on a high level, the highlights on the top line we shared on January 10 already, 14.5% growth in organic uh, in the local currency, 7.1% growth in Swiss francs. A lot of uh, appreciation of the Swiss francs, of course, in here. Adrian will go into all the details in regards to, to those uh, numbers. The EBIT reported slightly below last year. I think here we stay with our reported EBIT as, as a guiding principle. But at the same time, we know that here quite substantial one-time costs through the acquisitions are included. If we take those out, we have raised our EBIT performance by 80 base point in 23, reaching a level of 15%. We are especially proud of the strong cash generation that has led to a record in operating free cash flow of 1.37 billion Swiss francs, a plus of uh, almost 60%. I think this is, a, this is a, a clear manifest of the power of the company to generate cash uh, to the benefits of all. The key investment in, in 23 clearly is the, the closing of our transaction, the MBCC, which I will come in more details. We talk a lot about the cost of the transaction, but I believe it's significant to see that already in eight months we have been able to generate 41 million of synergies and more to come. Our innovation and sustainability drive, a key aspect of SICAS in the past and in the future, also here accelerating with the power that we gain by growing organically and uh, through acquisition. 108 uh, new patents, 188 new inventions. These are just signals of the power of this combined organization going forward. At the same time, we have done our homework and continue to do our own, let's say, improvements on the, on the CO2 reduction, talking scope one and two, with a reduction of 4.4% overall per ton sold. This picture is a picture that uh, I don't know how, but magically all the regions are at 15% growth. So, Adrian, thank you for balancing that so well. But, of course, uh, it's clear here this 15% growth in the region is uh, fueled by the acquisition, which obviously then also has helped uh, all the regions to, to reach uh, new heights. Um, the global business region, which is the last time that we report uh, independent, uh, without acquisition, reached double-digit growth, a clear a sign also of the recovery uh, of the automotive business overall, as well as our traction in gaining new uh, applications, especially on the e-mobility side in, in that business. It's not just the numbers that matter. We also have high emphasis on the non-financial areas. I talked about the CO2 reduction scope one and two, but also safety is a topic that we, that we consider a key element to make sure we have a safe work environment. We reduced the accident rate by almost 24%. Waste is bad. Waste is something in multiple ways that we want to reduce also here. Good progress. Water uh, consumption reduction. I think here all the arrows show in the right direction, but we can't stand still 
we have to go further also on that journey, and I come back to that uh, when I talk about the strategy 28. As always, it's uh, CK is investing in, in the future, investing inorganically as well as organically, and mentioned MBCC, the biggest investment, but we also did uh, two other acquisitions, Thyssen uh, in, uh, in the U.S. and Chema in Peru, and we also explore new ways of, uh, let's say, tapping into interesting uh, startup uh, companies here, a company uh, in Finland that has an excellent uh, uh, cementitious flooring system that we can leverage, and we took uh, a share uh, in that, or a stake in that, uh, in that company uh, that is uh, going to fuel some exciting specialty floors uh, in, uh, uh, in Zika. The investments organically are expansion of the footprint, reinforcing of strong hubs like the U.S. is a strong hub, more than 40 factories in, in the U.S. alone, and here we invest also in, into future growth. And the, the expansion in Sealy in Texas, the expansion in Chattanooga are a manifest also of our strong belief that North America is, is a place to be and a place to further invest. But that's not only there. India is mentioned here with a new factory in India. India is a booming market. Uh, I will show later on a bit more details on that. And innovation. Innovation, the opening of the technology center in, in Suzhou in China. It's the second largest uh, technology center, center of Zika behind uh, Zurich. It's a clear statement that uh, Asia, Asia Pacific with this hub, you know, building a, a strong competence level that influences the rest of the world as much as the rest of the world influences uh, Asia Pacific. I think it, this is a, a slide just showing the base of our business. In, in a way, we talk uh, more and more the vertical aspects of our business. And you see a strong balance. The infrastructure and the commercial are two very important segments for us, vertical markets. The residential, growing not, let's say, uh, being dominant, but uh, clearly visible and, uh, and uh, relevant and uh, a great opportunity for more. And then the automotive and the industry segment that is uh, also uh, an excellent uh, addition uh, to the three others. This is the base where we come from, and this is the base where we also build uh, the future. And it's a very strong uh, mix of, uh, of uh, vertical markets that we focus on. Another angle to look at uh, our business, the base business, is emerging and mature markets. We have always shared this view, but you see how the emerging markets uh, are catching up, 41%, while also mature markets are growing. So this is not the one or the other. Both of them can grow, and that's what we that's what we are uh, aiming at. The same is with the new build versus uh, refurbishment. Here you see the ratio as well. Our refurbishment is dominant. That comes uh, from our strong uh, position in, in Europe and in, uh, in North America, where a lot of refurbishment of infrastructure and building is, is a core business, while as the new build also is, of course, in emerging markets, uh, the, the majority and uh, our priority to grow. So it's also here, this is an excellent balance, uh, also hedging, let's say, besides the vertical through the, through the uh, geographical uh, balance uh, the company. We are very proud of our historical uh, performance data. We stand for market share gain. We stand for overproportional profitability improvement, and we have delivered that over the past six uh, years, starting 2018 as a as an indicator, uh, growing in Swiss francs 9.7% uh, annually and uh, growing uh, the EBIT 12.2% uh, 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 year over year. Here we took the liberty in 22 and 23 to show the uh, EBIT evolution, excluding the one-timers, which Adrian will go into details, uh, but it's, it's the underlying strong operational performance of the company over these six years, and we intend to continue that, of course, also in the next years ahead of us. Many questions uh, in, in this wild 20s came up. You know, how do you explain this? How is that? And how are you doing? And the markets are doing. I think we tried here to 
bring some clarity what happened in 2020 when we had an, a standstill of the economy worldwide. You know, we had a negative organic uh, growth. And we compare us, let's say, to our peers in the industry. This is uh, about a dozen uh, of players that are listed that we have data to that we can compare. You know, we all went into this COVID, let's say, incident and we had to preserve, preserve our our uh, companies, and I think we did well, but everybody had to adapt. And you see our peer uh, organic growth, our organic growth, almost at the same uh, same level. But then the year 21 was the year where things came back, volumes came back. And in, in, a, in a volume uh, uh, positive market, we excel. We have uh, clearly uh, surpassed our peers uh, in, in this uh, race for the volume, and uh, we, we uh, delivered very well. 22, the year where pricing was an absolute uh, mandatory uh, topic to offset the ever-rising uh, input cost. And here, looking for margin, looking for pricing, is, has been clearly a, a main focus in, in, those, uh, in, those, uh, in that environment, while also we have to consider that uh, our split is a little bit different than others, where the price increase in Asia has been a fraction of the price increase in uh, in Europe and in North America, given also the lower input cost variations there. So it is a, it's a strong uh, performance there as well. And then we come into 23 last year, a year again with a lot of challenges, negative volumes to start into the year. Uh, some of them have improved. Some have uh, more or less uh, stayed flat, but you see we grew by acquisition, obviously, no secret. But then we compare our 1.2 organic growth with the minus uh, 3.5 of our peers. I think a substantial overachievement in a, in a tougher market where less is available, but we succeeded to gain market share in a profitable way. Now, Talking about MBCC, my, my favorite topic anyhow for quite a while. You know, now it's real. Now we are uh, in execution mode. 6,000 employees uh, onboarded uh, on the 2nd of May. 2.1 billion uh, Swiss francs. That's the number we communicated at the beginning of the journey. Uh, con converting it into today's uh, Swiss franc is probably less than 2 billion, but still significant. And it's a, it's a major boost uh, to the organization, but it comes from the, from the, let's say, uh, complementarity that we have in the field. The portfolios, the strengths of combining two uh, major players offering to our customers uh, a full range, the strongest range uh, in the industry has shown huge potential, which leads to the next uh, slide, an important slide, of course, the synergies that we are generating through this uh, transaction. And as I mentioned, we already collected 41 million in 23, and we have a, a clear, let's say, pace uh, up to 100, 180 to 200 million in the years to come. And here outlining also how this uh, segmentation goes in 24 and 25. Wonderful, but this, these numbers are the result of all the complementarity that we see, complementarity on the commercial side, on the sales side, as well as on the cost side, where we have a tremendous uh, synergy potential and we go after it and we, we are doing very well on that journey. It's the people that make uh, such a transaction work. And uh, we have invested a lot and we still invest a lot into staying close to the organization. The new joiners as well as uh, the, the Zika organization, we, we measure this constantly. Uh, we call it the pulse check to see how the organization is, uh, is uh, uh, going along with uh, the strategic uh, direction. Is it understood? Is it, uh, is it positively uh, perceived? And, and here we, we, we see, you know, a, a picture that overall is very encouraging. But of course, you also see points where we have to go and uh, dial in and help the organization to, to, to improve. So it's an excellent uh, tool for us to, to safeguard that the, the main asset of this transaction, the people uh, on our side, on the new joiner side, are fully engaged in executing 
the, the initiatives that we have outlined uh, for the future. Let's talk a little bit our midterm aspiration. I think it was presented at the Capital Market Day where we said, okay, yes, we are here in 23. This slide is updated with the 23 figures. You know, aspiration wise, we are very clear. We want to continue to grow, grow profitable. Uh, ultimately, uh, we want to be in the 20 to 23% EBITDA range uh, going forward and 6 to 9% uh, CAGR in uh, local currency growth going forward. I think we are well on track into this, uh, into this journey. And a few aspects I would like to just remind us, you know, why we are so confident and what, why we have uh, such a great opportunity ahead of us. The market is huge. 110 billion is our addressable market. We have 11% market share. As you can see, it's quite fragmented. It's, uh, half of it is probably covered by the top 30 and the other half is then, uh, individually in, in local, local players or regional players. There's a lot to gain for us. 89% are still up for us to, to, to go for. And we intend also to, to raise our market share going forward organically and inorganically. I think that the strategy seek alike, quite simple, four pillars that are the, the engine of driving the right hand side, the financial results, the non financial results, which we have clearly also brought in line with our expectation, what we as a company are committing ourselves to, say it on the on the SBTI targets uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, but also on the people side, the column that is driving Everything we do, making sure that we that we maintain and build on the strong uh, engagement of our employees, but also then uh, the the natural resources to to do our own homework in helping to uh, preserve uh, uh, the the natural resources uh, going forward. Now this is a slide that shows how the six to nine percent are built up, and not so much on the underlying market or the acquisition. It's the core element, the key lever of the growth. It's the market penetration. And here for us, the leveraging of our strong position, which has been a key contributor in the past uh, six years as outlined, still a lot more that we can expect there. If we just bring all the countries to a similar level like the average, you know, we, we have magnificent uh, uh, growth potential. Cross-selling on the buildings, on the on the structures, we have so much more we can do, and we want to tap into that as, as well. Much more, the vertical markets uh, are a signal for how we are addressing uh, as an ad additional dimension also the, the potential that comes with the, with the nature of the construction. Multi-channel, indirect, direct uh, retail, uh, which then, of course, goes uh, more into the residential area. Huge opportunities. Our brand is the strongest brand in the industry. Let's leverage it. Let's bring it also more and more into the distribution, the retail. We can uh, definitely take great advantage of there. Then Christoph's uh, preferred the slogan, go where the money is. I think, yes, absolutely right. You know, we invest uh, in key markets where we, where we, where we know there is, there are activities and we want to, we want to, uh, to, to tackle them and not waste our energy on things that are irrelevant. Key geographies, I will show uh, another slide in this regards. That uh, goes in hand in hand with go where the money is. It's uh, also focusing on not neglecting, but at the same time being aware where the key geographies of our company is. And then we have high potential markets, specialty markets where we can also excel. And here, I would say uh, our adhesive business is a business that has, I say, Outstanding opportunities going forward. Our cementitious business, outstanding opportunities. So I think we want here also to leverage furthermore. The key geographies, uh, as I mentioned, look at the map. Not too much yellow, but the yellow represents 75% of the 110 billion. So, and we are in, in Europe, we are in the US, we are in China, very strong. Not to forget, the U.S. is our largest single market. 20% of our revenue is generated in the U.S. China is 10% of our 
revenue. It's, it's the second largest single country. Europe, okay, 27 countries. So we aggregate that. It's the, of course, the biggest single market uh, uh, by itself. But India, an emerging market. Japan, I would say an underestimated market for many Western companies, but we have the footprint in China, uh, in, sorry, in Japan, and Japan is a significant market with very interesting specific, uh, let's say, requirements. I will show that in a moment, how we tap into that and benefit from, from all these key markets leveraging uh, our competencies uh, across the globe. Looking into the U.S., yeah, I think everybody is aware that the U.S. is in a change mode. The outsourcing of manufacturing, which was the theme of the past 20 years, has come to a stop. It is coming back. Industry is coming home to, to, to the homeland. And it is called the reshoring and with significant projects. It's taking place. I mean, you see it in the statistics. This is, a, this is an example of the Samsung factory in Austin, Texas. I was there in, uh, in uh, September. It's huge. 557,000 square meter plant. This factory has 1,250 acre size. For those that don't understand acres, this is five square kilometers is this factory. It will generate 50,000 jobs. And the jobs generate cities around and infrastructure around. So this is not just the investment that happens, uh, let's say, on site. For those that live in Zurich, Zurich, the city has a size of 88 square kilometer. Five square kilometer is huge. I've never seen anything like that. And they are building the first factory of a plant of 10 factories on this, on this location. This is when, when America goes big, you know, they go big. And there are multiple projects like that taking place, say the semiconductor, say the battery drive, say the data centers, you know, we, we see a lot of uh, very positive momentum and this is new build. You know? And traditionally, U.S. is a market where refurbishment is, is a dominant uh, th theme like in Europe, but this is fascinating to see that this uh, reshoring takes place and we are part of that and we benefit a lot of those uh, activities. But talking about Japan, it's a 5 billion market potential. We all know Japan is not the growth engine. It's very stable, but it's very specific in, in competencies. Here we show the high-rise uh, building that, uh, that we have helped to, to build in, a, in an environment that is super challenging. And they always have a different approach to, to challenges. And those approaches make us a stronger company, contributing in Japan and taking those elements out. Our footprint in Japan has substantially increased with the three acquisitions we did uh, in the past, with starting with Diflex, hematite adhesives, and lately then MBCC adding. We are a powerhouse in Japan, and we want to share that then also in April when we do an, uh, let's say, uh, investor um, event in, in Tokyo showing, you know, how we capture the Japanese, but also Asian Pacific as a, as a, a key geographic uh, for the company. India, another key geography that is on the move. I think for me, most fascinating is India has always been, let's say, a, a continent of hope. But ultimately, what makes me confident that it is different this time is the investments go into infrastructure. Infrastructure first. The country is investing in building up the infrastructure, in transportation, energy. That's the foundation of any development uh, in any country. We see it in China. China invested heavily 20 years ago in an infrastructure that is well advanced to probably mature markets like Europe or, or uh, the US. But India is now on that move. And that gives me confidence. We all know still there's election year uh, and this may change, but we are optimistic that uh, the current government will will continue and so also the continuation of that investment into uh, meaningful infrastructure is going to, to be very beneficial for the country, but also for our business. This is the famous slide that I like so much. You know, we have the privilege to be active in a market that can only grow. That can only grow because the, the mega trends surrounding, we need more construction. We are loving mobility. We have 
to change the way we build, we have to change, we move around. And for this, the world gets more, let's say, challenging. It's more uh, difficult. And to navigate through that, we are the enabler. We have the solutions for sustainable construction. We have solutions to, to tackle uh, raw materials scarcity. We have a lot of additional, let's say, accelerating elements besides the megatrends themselves, population growth, and so on to benefit from. That's fueling our confidence in, in our forward-looking 6 to 9% growth ambition. If I look into some of those megatrends, the population growth, and back here to India, you know, it's the largest single country with the largest population. This population has huge demands in infrastructure. This, element, this example here is one of them that I compare with China, 508 kilometer long high speed train system. This is helping India a lot to connect while it is almost impossible to travel. If you have been to India in the last years, that's the most painful thing. This is tackling this challenge and more roads, train, ports, airports are in, in, in the build up and that's required to, to have a sustainable long-term growth for the economy in India. And uh, here we benefit immediately on these big projects, for instance, where, where we are at 20 different locations that are on, uh, along the 500 kilometers, uh, helping to create the required concrete uh, with the admixtures that we provide, making this fast, sweet, and efficient. Another population growth, Africa. Is, is, an, is a growing uh, uh, continent or exploding continent. Some of the countries have average uh, um, age of the population of 20 years. I would say in Switzerland, we are a bit above that. So that's something that will trigger, of course, future needs and demands. And, and here, this is an example out of Ethiopia, where this is a hydropower uh, dam that is built to provide infrastructure, energy to this uh, growing uh, population. We will see more of that uh, in, in, uh, in Africa because it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, connected to, to the growth of the population uh, in, in this area. The urbanization, Tokyo, has always been a crowded place and it had limitations in going upwards. But here, you know, the sky is the limit. You know, go further, go beyond. I was very proud to be on the sky tree several years back, tallest building in, in Japan, 634 meters, I believe. You know, that's a landmark building, but now it goes more commercial. This building here, that's a Budai Hills uh, building, where we also will have then our uh, investor uh, event in, is, is a great example how Japanese engineering is stretching, let's say, the limits, goes beyond and we are part of that. We enable that. Our, our solution developed in Japan for Japan are enabling this. For us, of course, this is a possibility then to leverage this, bring it to the west coast of the U.S., bring it to Turkey. Of course, not the same solution, but we have the competencies coming from, let's say, the most challenging environment and leveraging this ac across the globe. So here, fantastic uh, activities that just so we benefit First of all, of course, quite nicely on that building, but the competence that comes with it, our reputation as being the best source when it comes to the most challenging uh, uh, aspects of building, uh, waterproofing, structural, you name it. I mean, we are clearly here a leader and building further on our leadership position. We also have, uh, not to forget, we have built infrastructure, commercial buildings that are retuned. This famous uh, icon uh, in, in, in London, the Battersea uh, power station, has completely been repositioned. Uh, it's, it's, it's now a commercial center. It's a beautiful center, I believe. I haven't been there, but I hear. So kind of, yes, we are retuning, not tearing down and rebuilding. We, we maintain. There's a lot of activity going on to make this a suitable place for the new uh, usage of that building. And you see here some examples of what goes in there. Hidden, of course, because what you see, that's the surface, that's the floors, that's the, that's the, the, uh, the high rise uh, ceilings and so on. But behind, 
this structure needs to be from ground up uh, re-engineered, uh, and for this, our solutions are uh, first choice. I talked about scarcity of raw, uh, of, uh, raw material, and here one example is sand. I think it's, it's clear that the, the old days where sand out of the river was available in excess at no cost are over. And uh, here we have the means to make also secondary, less quality uh, sources usable and still have high performing solutions for our customers, but also for our own consumption of, uh, of um, uh, sand uh, in our products that we sell. Here we have a great competencies. Again, we leverage that. It is, uh, it is one that is located in Lyon in, in France. It is fantastic to see how this center together with the other centers that we have worldwide is tapping into new alternatives and make them, let's say, compatible for the future with the chemistry that we add uh, to those uh, sand alternatives. Labor shortages, skilled labor shortages is, is, is an element that is, let's say, mind-boggling, holding uh, things back. When I was in the U.S. early in the year talking to contractors, you know, they said to me, Look, I, could, I could hire 300 people immediately. I have the projects. I don't have the people. It is a major limitating factor for contractors to find, and it gets worse and worse. And it, it happens not only in Europe and in the U.S. It's a topic in, in, in China as well as in Japan anyhow. And what is the remedy to that? We need more simple solution, easy to apply. You know, we need uh, robustness that you also can be, work with less skilled labor and still do performing a, a job. Technological process. I think here that the transformation of the, the mobility, the, the, the car industry is, I think, evident. This opens up new opportunities for us. It started with the battery, but the batteries will also become more and more a means to, to uh, level out uh, demand uh, peaks and uh, become part of the, the grid uh, structuring. So it, it may be at home, it may be uh, in larger scale also for the energy provider, a mean to, to offset those uh, peaks and, 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 and level. So we, this is just, let's say, in a evolution and this not yet foreseeable where it will end, but we are part of this. And we are together with those uh, uh, battery producers, with those energy producers, we are working on the next generation, innovating the next uh, uh, generation of battery uh, efficiency battery uh, reliability, and so on. Another hot topic that I push very much is, you know, digital is the future. Construction will always be with something that is tangible, but how we construct will have a lot of digital elements in there. And here you see some example on the upper left side. Our digital tools help to characterize the input materials, sand aggregates that go into concrete. With that, we can then fine tune faster. We don't need, let's say, uh, endless trial and error. We can immediately uh, shortcut uh, the, the, the definition of the optimal uh, mix design through these uh, digital tools. Then we are following, let's say, our products in the pre-cured stage until it is in place making sure that there is no change in performance uh, over the time until it is set in place. The third step is then that we want to see our cured material, how it is performing over lifetime. Sensors on the roof that detect early on that there might be some leakages help to pre prevent major uh, renovation costs uh, because it's too late in detecting when it comes through the ceiling it's too late. When it's on top and you see there is a, a monitor that says here is some humidity, you can go spot-wise, fix it, and uh, you save a lot of cost uh, going forward. The same with infrastructure, bridges. You know, bridges are over the 50, 80 years of lifespan, aging, of course. And if we wait too long, the costs to remedy are outrageous, sometimes even uh, not... Uh, not uh, uh, even possible to repair but rebuild. 
sends us in the bridges, can and will tell us going forward when things are starting to occur that we can selectively, spot-wise repair. And I call it, you know, small invest in the beginning, saving big uh, over lifespan. That's the theme. Digitalization will help us to bring this to the market and say, look, with us, we, we fix it in the beginning so that we over time have much less cost. This is, this is the future in digitalization that we are driving. People, our 33,000 people, you know, it is to me absolutely the core of everything. And I don't want to make nice statements. It's just very simple. Our people are all equal. My statement on uh, day one with MPCC was very clear. You are as, as much sick as I am. There is no difference. This is day one for you. This is day, I don't know, uh, many days. You know, it doesn't matter. It's not we look, don't look back. We are together. We are equal. And I don't want any differentiation by any characterization in our organization. You know? We are absolutely equal in all aspects and discrimination or exclusion on any aspect is absolutely not uh, allowed and it is also against our performance drive. How could we exclude a certain, let's say, group of individuals? You know, this group of individuals represent diversity that makes us stronger. Very simple. My drive for equal opportunity, my drive for bringing this across is is also performance related. We are stronger in our diversity, and that's uh, that's my message to my organization. That's my message to everybody. You know, this this is very clear. We have to live this every day. A slide that we shared multiple times. It's to me the the, the accumulation of everything. You know, we had nice evolutions. Performance uh, requirements were growing in the in the years from the 90s into the 2000s and so on, very clear. We went higher. We had more density. But with these megatrends challenging us, the way we are building, the way we are moving is making life more difficult, more challenging. We are the remedy for that. We have solutions, smart solutions, that help to tackle those and turn those challenges into opportunities for our customer, but of course also for our company. Great opportunities. This acceleration on this uh, penetration uh, curve is going up every year, going into the next 20, 30 years. I'm fully convinced, and I call it a fantastic growth opportunity, besides the growing uh, need for construction overall. And with that, I would uh, then hand over to Adrian for the financial aspects. Very good. And thank you, uh, Thomas, uh, here for giving us the, the highlights uh, of the very successful year uh, 2023, but also showing here the opportunities in the initiatives uh, going um, forward. Um, a warm welcome also from my side to uh, um, all of you here in the room and the ones uh, joining online. I will now go into a bit more granularity on the uh, um, financial result in uh, 2023. Um, we have heard it. Uh, we have been operating in a, in a rather challenging environment, but Zika again has uh, delivered a record um, set of numbers in terms of sales, cash flow, and underlying profitability. Here again, the highlights. Uh, we posted... Um, a record sales level of 11.24 billion in sales, uh, passing here the 11 billion mark uh, for uh, the first time, representing a 14.5% growth in local currency, 7.1% in uh, um, Swiss francs. We significantly uh, improved underlying profitability on, on various levels, a particularly strong uh, material margin expansion, um, um, from 49.4% to 53.6, uh, an improvement uh, of 420 base points, but also on EBITDA level, uh, an absolute uh, record 2 billion and 45 uh, million, uh, an increase of 4.1% in spite here of uh, a significant uh, M&A related uh, one-offs. 
Also, I agree with uh, if you exclude exclude M and A related one offs uh, at 1.68 billion or 15 percent of of net sales on a reported uh, basis, as uh, already heard, uh, uh, 1.55 um, billion, uh, a 1.9 percent. Uh, decline compared to the previous year and on net uh, profit as well uh, 1 billion and 62.6 million a decline of uh, 8.6% uh, um, record operating free cash flow uh, this is an all time record 1.373 um, million almost 60% um, up um, from the uh, previous year uh, very strong you know, cash generation uh, overall throughout the, the year. Um, Rosie was uh, impacted by the acquisition of uh, NBCC, um, 16.3% down from 21.6 in the in the previous year. Uh, but uh, we have again, uh, as part of this strong cash generation, also showed a very significant. Deleveraging uh, uh, from, let's say, the peak uh, upon first time consolidation at that EBITDA level at the end of the year, already down to 2.6 uh, times uh, EBITDA. And then lastly, uh, as you have also uh, seen, a continued uh, increase uh, of uh, the dividend. Uh, here, our board of directors again proposes a dividend increase of 3.1%. By uh, uh, 10 Robin, uh, uh, 3 Swiss franc 30 uh, compared to 320 in uh, the previous uh, in the previous year. Um, I will now talk about uh, some of the elements uh, here more specifically, starting again here on the on the top line, uh, where you know overall sales growth of 14.5 percent in local currencies was uh, um, clearly very heavily driven. By uh, acquisitions, predominantly MBCC, here with 13.3% uh, adding a clear double-digit uh, contribution to top-line growth, but also organically 1.2% um, growth in a negative market, uh, and also with a, an improving volume trend, a clear improving volume trend throughout uh, the year 2023. Um, on the negative. Um, Currency effects, translation effects, very significant, minus 7.4%. And sometimes it's also good to see this in absolute terms, uh, almost 780 uh, million off translation impact given the strong Swiss franc depreciation against uh, uh, basically all um, uh, currency across, uh, across the world. But also uh, putting this a bit in context uh, here of the last uh, uh, three years, again, a double digit growth uh, as the uh, two preceding years uh, with a three year average of more than 15 percent uh, of, of growth, uh, you know, different driver and, and elements. But uh, I think very clearly here also showing uh, the resilience of our business model, the ability to grow. Uh, strongly also in challenging environments. And uh, this is uh, due to a strong balance, be it geographically, but also in terms of maturity of the markets uh, and many different uh, aspects uh, as well. Um, here looking at organic growth throughout the three years, uh, close to 10% organic growth uh, uh, per annum, while acquisition on average contributed 6% of Additional growth. If we look at uh, the P&L and uh, um, move uh, down here uh, from the, the sales line, as mentioned, uh, very strong delivery here on material margin, 53.6%, 420 base point improvement over previous year. If you look quarter on quarter, um, continued um, improvement also here in Q4. Uh, which uh, marked the further expansion of the material mar margin, 55.1% uh, uh, in uh, Q4. Uh, overall, across uh, the year, solid pricing in combination with a gradual decline of uh, uh, material uh, cost, but also ongoing structural 
uh, initiatives uh, here uh, supporting and expanding material uh, margin um, over overall. As a small negative, there was a, a small uh, a PPA related uh, effect. We'll come to this uh, a bit uh, later, but also here, um, procurement synergies in relation with the MBCC acquisition supporting uh, all uh, contributing here to this strong uh, material margin expansion in, in 23. On the operating cost side, and uh, here I'm referring to both personnel costs as well as other operating expenses, these costs overall developed over proportionally, but include, uh, as uh, mentioned, significant uh, one-offs uh, related to uh, the transaction and integration of uh, um, MBCC. Um, these one-time costs I will then detail a bit later on when we look at the uh, um, EBIT uh, bridge. Specifically on uh, uh, personnel cost here, we had an increase of 17.3% uh, uh, with the acquisition of MBCC, including uh, here related uh, one-off severance cost as the main uh, contributor. At the same time, uh, organic uh, um, headcount development was slightly negative. However, uh, wage inflation accounted for about 5% percent uh, here of uh, personnel cost increase on a like-for-like -like, uh, basis, leading to a negative uh, cost uh, leverage. Other operating expenses here increasing uh, significantly by 31 percent, but here the lion's share of uh, the extraordinary uh, one-time uh, costs are included also in the previous year. Um, uh, uh, one-time gain on our corrosion protection uh, business sale uh, also affecting here and uh, obviously um, uh, the uh, integration and acquisition cost of MBCC, 131.5 million lion share here included in other operating expenses. If we exclude uh, these items, uh, um, these costs increase by 17%, uh, largely here driven by the addition of MBCC, but also uh, due to the general inflation environment, uh, higher energy costs, but particularly also the fact that we didn't um, reduce here marketing and, and, and travel cost. Uh, we maintained here a very strong customer engagement uh, uh, in all market-facing uh, activities. As a result, and including uh, all these items, EBTA still grew, as mentioned, 4.1% to $2 billion and uh, um, 45 uh, million. On the depreciation and amortization line, uh, here a growth of 28.9% here, uh, primarily uh, related to the additional intangible amortization relating to MBCC, while uh, the overall uh, increase in depreciation um, was largely in line with, uh, with sales growth. Consequently, EBIT on a reported basis, 1.55 billion declined by 1.9% from 1.58 billion. However, uh, excluding these M&A related one-timers, uh, EBIT increased by 80 base points, 12.7% to 1.68 um, billion. The various uh, elements here of uh, the uh, EBIT bridge from 22 to 23 are uh, illustrated on that side. And given, let's say, all the impacts, it probably warrants here a bit of a, a closer look and uh, some more granularity behind it. Again, if we start uh, here on the left-hand side, we've reported EBIT 2022 at 15.1% net sales and eliminating both here the one-time gain and uh, uh, also in 22 um, acquisition costs relating to MBCC. We arrive at an adjusted uh, 2022 EBIT uh, of 1.49 billion or 14.2% of net sales and doing the same in 23 on the other side of the chart uh, here um, reported EBIT of 1.5 um, five um, five um, billion 
adding back here the uh, one-time impact of 131.5 um, million, arriving here at an adjusted uh, EBIT of 15%, 1.68 um, billion here, this 80 base points uh, um, in improvement. But if we unpack here this uh, M&A cost adjusted performance, further we see a significant um, organic like for like increase in uh, in EBIT margin from 14.2 to 15.8, strongly uh, driven here by uh, organic material uh, margin, while inflationary driven uh, cost uh, leverage was negative, as already alluded to. And then we have the the MBCC contribution, which uh, overall in absolute terms was uh, significantly, but is uh, coming obviously as uh, expected with an incoming lower profitability and additional um, purchase price um, allocation effects, particularly on intangible amortization in here with a certain um, dilution here, the incoming dilution effect, 50 base points uh, on the PPA, um, both the short term as well as the ongoing amortization, 70 boy base points. But we can also see here uh, the already strong impact of uh, synergies uh, here, um, 41 million. We have heard the number very well on track and uh, already starting to reverse here part of uh, the initial um, dilution. If you go back to uh, the p and and uh, in looking below the EBIT line, uh, also here, um, significant uh, impact of MBCC-related elements, net interest cost uh, increased by 135 million, which uh, or are 135 million, and this represents a 95 million increase uh, largely related to additional debt and uh, higher interest cost in connection with uh, um, MBCC, but also on the other financial expense uh, side here, um, 78 million. This is an increase of 41 million uh, up from 37. Uh, here, uh, the main drivers are hyperinflation accounting, um, Argentina and Turkey, uh, but also higher hedging costs, uh, uh, particularly related to uh, an increased uh, interest differential as well as uh, valuation um, effects. Um, as a result, net um, financial expenses in total increased by 131 million to 212.7 million on overall. On the income tax side, uh, here um, effective uh, group tax rate did see a decrease from 22.4 to 20.5%. Uh, uh, overall, we uh, um, are seeing a slightly decreasing uh, expected group tax uh, rate, uh, but the effect was compounded by uh, a positive one-time impact related to a change in estimate in deferred taxes uh, relating to the former Parex uh, uh, China business and the uh, planned here legal uh, restructuring. Um, this uh, has essentially then led to um, uh, a tax rate of 20.5%. Uh, and overall, a net profit uh, of 1 billion and 62.6 million, a decrease of 8.6%. Uh, Turning to uh, the balance sheet, uh, obviously also here, MBCC with uh, an impact with balance sheet uh, uh, total uh, increasing by 33% uh, to roughly uh, 15 billion. Uh, the decrease in uh, current uh, assets um, primarily due to a reduced uh, um, but still very solid cash position that was used uh, as uh, a partial financing of uh, the MBCC transaction while working capital balances with accounts receivables and inventories um, uh, decreased uh, uh, the ratios, albeit on the proportionally uh, due to disciplined uh, networking capital management and uh, also to uh, um, inventory uh, valuation uh, effects uh, here. 
On the non-current asset side, uh, also here, uh, biggest um, contributor, MBCC, additional fixed assets, goodwill, and uh, amortizable, intangible um, assets, uh, um, non-current assets going up from 6.3 billion to 10.85. But uh, given ongoing amortization, but also uh, uh, currency effects already reducing this balance uh, since the initial um, consolidation in June by uh, more than 500 uh, million. Looking at the, the passive uh, side here of the balance sheet, uh, current liabilities development uh, mirroring accounts receivable. And here, uh, obviously, also a big change. Financial liabilities did increase due to uh, a 2.9 billion of uh, Swiss franc and uh, euro bond offering in uh, uh, 23 to uh, finance the MBCC transaction as well as the utilization of uh, our RCF facilities um, partially uh, offset by the early conversion of uh, our remaining uh, convertible bond uh, 1.24 uh, billion reduction. Total financial liabilities at the end of 23 stood at 5.86 billion, an increase of 1.9 billion overall uh, compared to the end of uh, 22, a net debt uh, at 5.2 billion, uh, up from 2.1 billion a year uh, earlier. Equity um, as a result um, here of solid um, profit generation net of dividends, as well as the early conversion of uh, the convertible bond, increased by close to 1 billion or 19%, uh, representing an equity ratio of close to 40%. And then lastly, as mentioned, uh, ROSI uh, decreased uh, to 16.3% from 216 But if you uh, adjust this for acquisition, uh, the increase uh, was uh, about uh, 200 base points to 23.5% uh, overall. Turning to cash flow, one of the very strong elements of uh, 23, and here, um, here we see the, the strong increase and the components, uh, obviously strong profitability as the basis, but also uh, increased uh, depreciation amortization, which is about 102 million higher than in the previous year, uh, adding um, roughly 500 million, but particularly also here networking capital, um, very um, disciplined uh, management here, um, adding 82 uh, million of cash generation uh, compared to about 326 million of uh, um, uh, build up in the previous uh, year. So um, I think a, a very strong and important focus on this area generating um, um, significant um, upside here on the uh, the cash flow side. And then uh, um, capital expenditure with 273 million on a, a net basis, about 40 million higher than in the in the previous year. As a result uh, of the strong cash generation, um, we have already strongly delevered uh, here from the peak in June 23, uh, when we showed here the uh, uh, initial consolidation of MBCC, where our leverage uh, momentarily stood at 4.1 net debt EBTA, of course, uh, without any profitability from MBCC uh, against it and other uh, a key contributor, obviously, of this uh, strong deleveraging here in the second half of 23 was the uh, um, um, convertible bond uh, a conversion with overall uh, a debt reduction in the last uh, six months from uh, um, a net debt reduction from 7.3 billion in mid 23 to 5.2 billion at the end of um, 20. 23 and uh, with our uh, net debt EBTA ratio at 2.6 times on a reported uh, basis. Then lastly, um, this brings me to 
the dividend proposal, um, as mentioned um, um, earlier, the board of directors of SICA proposes again a higher dividend uh, compared to the previous year, which marks the 12th uh, consecutive uh, year of dividend increases. It is proposed to increase the dividend by 10 Roppen to uh, 3 Swiss franc 30 per share or an increase of 3.1%. 50% of this proposed payout will come out of retained earnings and the other 50% out of the uh, capital contribution reserve. Uh, the overall payout ratio uh, here corresponds to roughly 50% of net profit attributable to uh, shareholders. With this, uh, I conclude here the financial part, and we will now come to the outlook for 24. Oh, good morning, everyone. Pleasure for me uh, to present to you for the first time on uh, Europe, uh, Middle East and uh, Africa. I'm uh, running the uh, region now for uh, four months, so I'm still a bit in the learning phase. But it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to get to know the new colleagues and uh, to see also the opportunities that also uh, EMEA has. You know, often it's been forgotten a bit and it's standing a bit in the, in the shadow of, uh, of Americas. But there is a lot going on. I'm, I'm amazed. And we just have to align now the organization uh, to get uh, to these opportunities uh, here as well. So last year, the focus, uh, you heard it also from Thomas and Adrian, the focus was on uh, margin and pricing. And I think EMEA has been doing quite a good uh, job there. And this year, the clear focus is on uh, growth and on uh, uh, volume. And uh, you heard about this famous concept of go where the money is, which created a lot of growth in uh, the Americas. I'm bringing this now to EMEA and we're doing... Uh, a lot of uh, workshops now with the companies trying to find out where these opportunities are, where is the money in the next two years, and then accordingly uh, align uh, the organization uh, towards, uh, you know, these opportunities that that are around. Um, it's interesting. Uh, EMEA is a, is a very heterogeneous uh, uh, region. So you've got the growth engines, Africa, Middle East, Europe East, and there it's very clear. We will continue seeing very good, strong, double-digit growth also this year. There is a lot going on. And then, you know, we have the Dach region. We have also a bit Europe North, uh, for example, where I tell my guys, look, we got it. This is where we have to create growth. Growth is not falling from heaven. We have to uh, create it. It's maybe a little bit more challenging uh, in uh, in these areas, but it is absolutely also uh, uh, possible and there is a lot of money i'm amazed so infrastructure pops up all over the place also in germany uh, i'm i'm really as impressed you know how much money european union uh, for example also the deutsche bahn you know they're going to invest in germany this year and of course in the in the in the months or uh, in the years uh, to come to renew their uh, their infrastructure system there is investment into nuclear plants in uh, in France. Uh, they have six projects that are ready to be built, and they're talking about eight additional uh, nuclear plants that they uh, that they uh, want to build. In in the UK, they talk about a second one. These are huge projects for us. This is this is really this is where the money uh, is. Water. I mean, you've seen uh, hydro plants. Uh, uh, projects, uh, not only in Africa, but also in uh, in uh, Europe, uh, of course. You know what's going on in Saudi Arabia. This is uh, is really unbelievable. Even for a for an American, this is uh, seeing what's going on there. You know, this is uh, uh, really uh, really impressive. And then, for example, data centers. Uh, interesting for me to learn. You know what has started in the U.S. would say three, four, five years ago 
is now just starting in, uh, in Europe because companies want to have their data in the local company. They don't want to have the data somewhere sitting in a, in a U.S. Uh, data center. And it's, it's really impressive how many data centers are going to be built by U.S. companies, actually. It's interesting. Are going to be built all over, uh, all over uh, Europe. Semiconductors, what you've seen from, from Thomas in Texas, you know, these are now U.S. companies going to build also semiconductors in Europe, in, in Germany, uh, for example, Intel. I'm sure you heard about that, but it's not the only one. There are other semiconductors, and these are big, these are big businesses uh, for, uh, for Sika because we contribute all over these, uh, these uh, projects. So there is money to win in EMEA, no doubt. And, of course, we're ambitious people. Uh, we will try to get uh, as much as possible uh, to participate here. Then the whole uh, distribution topic, retail and e-commerce in particular, uh, here we want to make a big step uh, forward. I must say MBCC is a very good completion of what we're doing. So in Germany, for example, we're not really strong in, in retail. Now, these guys come with a strong brand, for example, PCI. You might have heard of it. Check uh, yourself in, in, uh, when you have a little job site at home. I'm sure you're going to see PCI branded uh, tile adhesives, leveling mortars, tile grouts. It's, it's a real strong uh, brand. And we will, these guys will help us now to, uh, to build uh, further our footprint in, in uh, retail uh, in Germany or in the Dach uh, region uh, here, for example. Then the whole CO2 or sustainability topic. It's on one side, of course, we're trying to reduce our own footprint. On the other side, we are pushing very strongly to turn this trend into business uh, for us. And there is on the one side, uh, the newly integrated uh, automotive and industry business. So this is the EMEA part is now run by, uh, by us or by me uh, here uh, also. And here, of course, I think we presented this before. It's e-mobility. It's uh, the battery assembly. There are a lot of battery plants being built in Europe, also by uh, non-European company or, or car manufacturers or battery manufacturers. And of course, the whole topic of renewable energy, wind, solar, wind is an absolute fantastic business for Sika because we help building the blades with our industry uh, uh, technologies. We also be, help to build the molds for uh, producing these uh, these uh, blades. But of course, we're also heavily uh, involved in building the tower. There's a lot of concrete involved. There's a lot, lot of grouting mortars involved, anchoring adhesives involved. And here, C-Canal together with MBCC, we have an absolute fantastic uh, 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 footprint. On the construction side, we have a very strong initiative. So we go now and visit all these companies and institutions, universities, cities that made net zero pledges. And we present them our technologies, helping them to bring their CO2 footprint down. So we have, for example, uh, uh, we, are, we are a leader in uh, green roofs or, of course, also in uh, thermal insulation of, uh, of buildings, houses, etc. And we have uh, many other technologies helping these companies and institutions to reduce their CO2 uh, footprint. Uh, digital lead generation, it's something... But I think uh, Europe has a bit of uh, a backlog. Uh, this is, of course, this I bring with me from uh, from America, so where we started this very early. And, I mean, really unbelievable, uh, or very good success uh, we have here. You know, winning projects through digital uh, channels where our customers contact us digitally. It's not the Sika uh, salesperson going there anymore. It's a, it's a request coming through these channels, and we turn that then into into business for us. And this is something uh, we're going to push now very strongly also in, uh, in uh, EMEA. People, I think I said this also many times before, you heard it from Thomas, this is not just a saying or a blah, blah, this is key. And Sika uh, is a fantastic place to work at for talented people, but sometimes we are maybe a bit too humble, too Swiss, and do forget to talk about it also uh, towards a bit the outside in social media. And this is something we want to do a bit uh, more strongly. Uh, here now in EMEA, we have a project which we call uh, Cool Sika. So we want to really position Sika as the coolest place to work for in the industry among, let's say, talents coming from universities, uh, Etc. And last but not least, 
MBCC integration is uh, progressing very, very well. It's a pleasure to to work with these guys. It's uh, you know originally we thought uh, they had come with a different culture uh, than our culture, but it's totally wrong. I think they were just waiting for being part of a company like Sika, you know, where they can live their their entrepreneurial culture, their professional culture, uh, much stronger than before being part of a huge conglomerate and never really knowing what uh, what's going on. It's super professional people. They know what they're doing. Uh, they have very good products, uh, actually. And the combination now, Sika and, and, and MBCC, and that was always our target, is making this one plus one, uh, uh, three, no doubt. So uh, very well progressed and uh, pleasure to see how this is now further... Uh, developing. And I think now we go to Asia. Uh, Americas, I'm sorry. Hey, Mike. Okay, friends, good morning. Good morning. Uh, and best regards from here in Boston, Massachusetts. It's uh, really my pleasure to briefly discuss with you uh, our outlook for the region of Americas. Uh, maybe beginning with North America uh, in 2024, we expect a slightly negative organic uh, market development overall while maintaining a, a really a stable development in both our infrastructure and commercial construction uh, activities. In manufacturing activities will remain solid. Uh, development in residential construction will begin a bit negative uh, due to continuing high interest rates, but certainly uh, will be improving in the second half. Uh, of the year here in, uh, in North America, particularly. For Latin America, on the other hand, uh, will continue to deliver a very positive organic development across uh, all sectors of our business. So uh, we've had a fantastic year previous year, and we see that to continue now uh, for us in, uh, in Latin America. Now, looking uh, at, at the surge in, uh, in manufacturing facility investment, Driven initially by the uh, by the Chips Act and the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies, we see here uh, continuing huge opportunities, as uh, you've already heard about from Thomas on this uh, fantastic Samsung Samsung project in Texas, where the phase two of that project is now already underway, and uh, many project many phases still to come, and we're active in all of those. So uh, now here in the top image. Uh, on the right side, you see um, a, a picture of our data center. Uh, this is one of over 2,500 data centers in the United States. These data centers that data centers play a crucial role in supporting our uh, digital infrastructure, enabling connectivity, and powering various online services and applications. Data centers uh, are just one of the many uh, targeted markets in our vertical market approach. Uh, you heard a little bit from uh, Christoph in this vertical market approach. This approach utilizes our unique cross-selling potential to uh, to maximize the turnover and return on each and every available project. So we pull as much uh, turnover from those projects as possible while simplifying the construction process for our customers. Uh, also on sustainable energy, uh, you also heard this from, from Christoph. It's similar. Uh, we have these projects are really gaining steam now in the Americas with various onshore and offshore wind applications. Uh, also hydropower projects underway in the US, in Mexico, in Colombia. Uh, we really have here on these facilities, numerous applications for green roofing, for facade insulation, solar, and uh, EV battery plants. In these EV battery plants, of course, we, we not only build the factories, but we uh, put products into the, the finished goods coming from those factories. We see these applications continuing to gain momentum uh, really throughout the region. With our acquisition now of NBCC and Decent in the U.S. market, we uh, we see excellent opportunities in the underground business with mining activities in uh, in Canada, where we, we really see a big boom now in underground mining activities in Chile and Peru, while we also see tunneling activities offer huge cross-selling opportunities uh, across the region. Again, we're really uniquely positioned to benefit from these uh, from these underground applications due to our diverse range and uh, the experienced people. In the automotive uh, business, uh, here once again, uh, we've reached the, the pre-COVID levels uh, for the car build rates. 
This uh, we can combine with our transformational activities in e-mobility, and uh, we'll continue to provide higher content potential for each and every uh, vehicle that's coming off, particularly in these e-vehicles e-vehicle, e with the batteries. So um, here we'd like to help uh, in the construction of the facilities and also what goes in them, uh, making them lighter, stronger, and of course, uh, more sustainable. You also heard briefly about the uh, MBCC integration activities. Here, we're well on track. The synergies are coming. You heard from Adrian, these uh, these uh, synergies continue to expand. And uh, we're really excited by the uh, the strength of the people that we picked up from MBCC. Uh, you heard from Christoph already. These, these uh, people really like us and in our culture. So we were able to put these two teams together and uh, we, we drove many, many synergies, uh, particularly in the commercial side, to uh, continue to grow this business. So we're really excited where we are now with uh, with this team. So briefly, I guess that the region is is well prepared. Uh, we're ready for another uh, great year in 2024. And of course, I, I uh, would be negligent to also mention, of course, the best people in the construction industry. I'm uh, really, really proud of our SICA team and what we've been able to accomplish. And uh, I'm very confident that we'll continue this uh, this great performance now uh, to lead the industry in uh, 2024. Then we have uh, Philip. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning, Adrian. Uh, good morning, everybody in, in Zurich. I'm joining remotely as well. Um, and take the opportunity to present uh, the future in Asia Pacific. I think we've seen over the last past years that uh, Asia Pacific has been always a strong contributor uh, to organic growth, and we see that trend to continue in, in the years to come. I know it's a very young region from a population point of view. Over 50% of the world population lives in Asia, and the continuation of urbanization and also uh, the strong trend in, of those mega cities continuing to grow really gives us a lot of opportunities in, in, uh, in the construction market in Asia. Um, we see a continuing underlying market trend. We also, from a market share point of view, Asia Pacific is probably the region with the lowest market share and therefore plenty of growth opportunities. And we also see a lot of increasing building standards in, in the years to come and add those mega projects, whether it's tunnels, subways, uh, wastewater treatment plants emerged. The need for higher end products where our products come into play are really increasing. So we see, in, in essence, we see opportunities on all areas, whether it's infrastructure projects, whether it's commercial projects, but also in the residential market. You know, as my colleagues from three, the two other regions uh, presented as well, MBCC integration is really going well. You know, we were lucky to have a very strong team join us in May of last year. And um, so we, we start to see combined opportunities, uh, mainly in the infrastructure projects that I mentioned earlier, but also in concrete production and also in the flooring application for commercial projects. Uh, if I go into a little bit of more detail of the countries, we see in China, for, uh, especially the, the continuous growth. Um, this is driven especially by our distribution business, but also flooring projects uh, in the commercial area are adding to this to this growth opportunities. And we see in another strong year in these particular areas also coming up this year. Thomas already mentioned the infrastructure needs of this growing region. You know, Thomas specifically highlighted India, which uh, the airport projects, infrastructure projects in, in bridges, um, roads, tunnels, uh, the high-speed trains, you know, these are all being unblocked. You see funding. And you know, when I last visited Mumbai, it was a, a tremendous change from um, from three, four years ago um, with all those roads being building being built around the, the city uh, that ease transportation. And we see continuous projects coming up, lining up. We're adding also, you know, as you see in the one plan that we built last year, we're adding uh, capacities to, to be able to deliver those projects across a country that has huge needs uh, in, in, in infrastructure. And also in Southeast Asia, another similar trend. And the, the success that we've had in distribution business in China the last few years, we also see that as a, as a model to roll that out into other countries in the region. Uh, we see India, as I mentioned, but also many countries in Southeast Asia, whether it's Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, 
um, that are a few years behind in a trend and where we're taking the learnings out of China and, and bringing this retail leadership journey, as we call it, within the region to other countries. And we see tremendous you know, results already now by opening new points of sales, really copying the success uh, that we had the last four or five years in, in the Chinese market. And then the other opportunities that I would like to highlight is uh, you see for many, um, you know, whether it's tariffs or other geopolitical reasons, you see many manufacturing companies, they have a China plus one uh, strategy, meaning that they want to build outside of China at least one um, other manufacturing hub. Often you see plans being built in, in, in Vietnam or other Southeast Asian countries, but also India profiting from here. These are EV production, these are battery production, semiconductors, other light manufacturing. They all need special flooring products. And here we're extremely well positioned to, to work with these investors, to work with these projects, to supply, um, to supply our products into those, uh, those projects and really enabling and, and profiting from this trend of additional manufacturing hubs being built in the region. Uh, the other area, Mike mentioned it as well, is in the, in the, the car production rates that are going back up to pre-COVID levels. We see also our take in e-vehicles is higher than in uh, traditional combustion engine vehicles. And the contacts that we have with Japanese, Chinese, Korean, or even in Vietnam, uh, producers of such e-vehicles really allows us to, to sell products into these markets in a, in a, in a higher growth rate. So overall, very positive outlook for the years to come for Asia Pacific. And also, you know, we have a strong team that I inherited from Mike um, that, that was built over the years, as I mentioned, joined in May by the MBCC team, uh, unique in, in, in the markets. And therefore, we were really well positioned to profit from growing underlying markets. And um, would like to thank, take the opportunity to thank all team members out of uh, in Asia Pacific that contributed to, that contributed to the results uh, of last year and already started working full speed on the results of of this year. So back to to Zurich now, Thomas. I think uh, you're up next. Thank you, Philip. This brings me to the last slide, and uh, combining all the regions together, our guidance uh, for this year, early in the year, still. A lot of uh, uncertainty around us. So we have uh, concluded uh, 6 to 9% in local currency. All in is the guidance on the top line. And on the bottom line, we stay a bit boring with our statement, but meaningful overproportional EBTA growth is our aspiration. And that's what we are going to deliver in uh, 24 again. The strategic targets outlined in our 28, which are midterm targets, are clearly a focus for us to deliver in 24. The first set uh, of uh, uh, directive results, which will then over time lead into the range that we have indicated uh, uh, in the strategy. With that, I would uh, now open up uh, for the Q&A for the next uh, half an hour. Good. Do we have microphones? It's working. Oh, super. Um, John Revel, Reuters. I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Um, NBCC was the biggest acquisition, I think, in Seekers history. And now that's been completed. So I was just wondering, um, are big acquisitions possible moving forward now? Or what's going to be the acquisition strategy moving forward? Is it going to be like lots of little things? Or could you do something big? That's my first question. And then the second question is, um, a lot of Swiss industrial companies have raised concerns about the franc in recent months and uh, and the problems it's causing for them. Now, I know you guys do local for local, so it probably doesn't affect you directly that much. But, I mean, what's your views on the franc at the moment? And is it a concern? Thank you. Okay, I think I'll, I'll work on the first one and Adrian's on the second. No, I think the the, the acquisition uh, strategy hasn't changed. We are uh, doing a bolt on transaction as the fragmentation of the market is offering these opportunities across the globe. 
Big transactions are absolutely part of our midterm strategy. We will, of course, balance those, uh, not uh, going uh, ballistic in our leveraging. We want to maintain our A- minus uh, rating as a very solid foundation of the company. But as you can see on the chart from Adrian, our uh, leverage is now at 2.6. It will come further down in the years ahead of us, which then uh, will open up also possibility to finance uh, another big transaction. So we are clearly also spotting and looking out and evaluating a large transaction. But given our current, let's say, debt level and uh, also the deleveraging, I would say it is not something which we come tomorrow forward uh, with a big transaction, but within our period that we have guided, uh, I certainly see opportunities for that. On the Swiss, on the Swiss Franc, yeah, I don't want to sort of evade this question, but at the same time, it's probably the most difficult question you can ask. Uh, what is the forecast on you know, currency uh, movements. Uh, um, I think for us, obviously, as a Swiss-based group with uh, um, largest part of uh, the business outside of Switzerland, this is a topic. Uh, this being said, um, as in previous year, we continue, uh, you know, to believe that obviously the uh, uh, direction will not change. If anything, uh, Swiss franc will, will rather uh, uh, continue to, to strengthen. I think in our case, um, very clearly, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge is the translation. We have a very strong natural hedge uh, uh, due to um, the, let's say, decentralized uh, nature of uh, both revenue and, and, and cost with, uh, let's say, relatively little Swiss franc cost overhang. So it is uh, um, here a, a question of, let's say, managing uh, this year uh, more from a translation perspective uh, overall, and that's just what we have to uh, live with. This is not uh, uh, changing anything, but we don't have uh, um, big impacts on, let's say, more the transactional side, given uh, the very strong natural edge. Good. Chris? Hello, thank you for taking my question. I have two, if I may. The first one is about uh, your material margin assumption on your on your guidance, and uh, the second one is about the maybe if you can answer this question, the market share of Sika uh, in the U.S., especially on the uh, infrastructure business. Okay. Shall I take the material margin? Um, yes. I mean, if you sort of look at overall. Let's say margin progression here, sort of the material margin uh, element is uh, obviously one of the one of the, the pillars, one of the buckets we have uh, uh, here also uh, guided, and we'll continue to do that. That uh, um, you know where we um, see the business sit overall is uh, you know 54 to 55 percent um, here material margin. Uh, we had 53.6 for the uh, the, the the whole. Um, year uh, clearly here the ambition is to push that uh, um, further here to 54 uh, or, or slightly above. Uh, obviously, there is several elements. Uh, we continue also to see here volatility on the input cost side, although there has been a gradual reduction, uh, more of a plateauing here now with some of the materials, for example, cement, uh, you know, increasing. Here and there, uh, we have uh, uh, obviously topics uh, such as uh, the, uh, the the Red Sea, which is currently not having a, a big impact. Uh, um, but uh, obviously, this uh, does uh, infuse here, uh, um, you know, some uncertainty on the progression. But our um, assumption uh, today is probably more sort of a flattish development going forward, which uh, should also, with uh, let's say continued uh, pricing here uh, supports that uh, journey going forward with all, let's say, the other elements playing here into uh, here the material margin. Okay, on the, on the U.S. infrastructure market share, that's a loaded question. It's a, it's a very granular. I, I can say there are probably three, four main players uh, in that field. We are one of them. I would now rate them. I think it's uh, it's a, it's a healthy market for us where we have room to grow. 
So we we are taking advantage of that. But uh, it would be wrong to say, you know, we are by far the largest or, you know, it is, it is a, it is a particular market, uh, a few players, strong players, and we are one of them. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Benjamin Trieber from NZZ. Also two points regarding North America, if I may. The first one, um, you talked about the, the growth potential due to the infrastructure programs. Um, how much of this support and how much of the potential for SICA would be at risk in case of a return of, of Donald Trump into the White House? That would be the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, that's a very speculative, um, but Short term, I don't think that we would see a stop that is already in execution. There might be shifts. There might be uh, different priorities. It might be uh, that the other areas would uh, benefit. Um, Biden, as well as Trump, have a very clear focus on the U.S. economy. Maybe they have a different approach how to stimulate the economy. But uh, I'm not at all afraid, and uh, I don't take any part in, the, in this. But I would say many of these infrastructure uh, activities have been, let's say, planned and are in execution. Uh, it, it would be very, let's say, uh, cumbersome to stop them in mid in mid uh, execution. So I, I'm not concerned about that. Thank you. And secondly, if I may. Um... Holcim is splitting off its U.S. business. It's separating it completely and saying that would be the best way to serve the market. Uh, would that be an option for Sika as well? And why not? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I would I would say look, the I don't want to comment on on those strategic moves. This is a different company. This is a different uh, business. It's a heavy material uh, business. We are in the construction chemicals. I think when we presented our numbers of the past, you know, this company, our company has benefited a lot of our global diversity. The markets are different, you know. We leverage that across the board. Our tremendous uh, growth and also profitability gain is based on our diversity that we have not one or two pillars, we have multiples. And it's not just the three regions. You heard it also, you know, the Middle East is, is a powerhouse. We benefit. Japan is different. China is, is of course, a, a huge market. India, I think we benefit from diversity. We are local. Of course, our products are locally produced and locally adapted to the to the needs. But behind that, we have a, a great leverage. So if we would spin off one of that, you know, we would weaken uh, our company. And, and, and as we say, when we acquire one plus one equals three, we believe three divided by two is less than 1.5. So this is not something that we would consider. Okay. Yep. Remo. Thank you. Remo Rosenau, Helvetische Bank. Uh, looking at your guidance of six to nine percent growth in local currencies, uh, including acquisitions, of course. Uh, MBCC should add four to five percent alone. You had also a few other smaller acquisitions, so let's say five. So at the lower end of this uh, guidance, you only expect one percent growth, or basically not nothing, in 2024. I mean, uh, it, that contradicts to all you said the last one and a half hours, basically. I mean, listening to all the, this presentation, it doesn't sound like zero percent growth, you know, aside of the acquisition. So uh, could you elaborate on this lower end of the and even the higher end is not that high? Eh? Sure. And that's I think we have to, you know, we cannot change the world to the liking that we have. Our midterm strategy shows nicely what is the, the evolution of our growth. It has Base growth from the market. It has the market penetration and acquisition. But we are at the moment in a world where we have minus 4% market evolution. We delivered 1.2 on, on top. So we have a gap 4%. And this 
we cannot neglect and say 24, everything is at zero. Now the market will give us one or two percent and then we add and then we add. We have to be cautious that the market hasn't overnight changed into a neutral or positive. We still have this minus four that we are going into the year. And we just have to be a bit cautious that we don't uh, expect that this is now in the next six months going crazy and we have, let's say, boost from, from the market. So this is, uh, this is guiding us to say, let's not be ignorant. You know, the, the market is still overall, besides all the fantastic elements that are there, we do have impact that are holding back, let's say, our, our industry and uh, we cannot neglect that. So this, this 4% that the market is down when we compare to our peers is also going into 24, let's say, the starting uh, base. Yes, I believe that the markets will uh, pick up. Markets uh, like EMEA and uh, Christoph mentioned, you know, we are, we are hopeful at the same time, shall we now, in, in the second months of the year, bet on a huge recovery of Germany? I don't think so. China is, a, is for us a solid contributor, but it is running below its potential. And the Chinese government is doing a lot to go back to, let's say, uh, growth rates like in the past, but it is not that easy. Yeah? It's more complex. And also, let's say, the geopolit geopolitical uh, differences are not helping. I think we, we are just, let's say, well advised to not neglect where we come from and how fast things can change. But that doesn't change my midterm view. You know? These this are wild 20s where things go a little bit crazy, but the demand is there. The need to transformation is there. So I'm very optimistic in this regards, but you know, this, this uh, guidance is a guidance. You're right. Four to five percent is probably coming. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's fair. There's organic growth in it. But one thing I can assure you, when we go on the field, we don't go on the field to tie. We go to the field to win. That's, that's secret. We, we, this is our spirit. We did it last year. We outperformed. We will outperform this year, but we can't make the world, let's say, a growing environment just like that. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my second question on the uh, targeted margin improvement. Um, let's assume you get to 54% uh, gross margin, uh, which would be 40 basis points more. Uh, however, is it fair to assume that a bigger positive element should come from OPEX and from personnel costs, which have increased quite a lot last year due to the known factors of MBCC? So there is, I mean, the bigger part of the margin improvement should stem from OPEX and personnel, right? I mean, um, probably here also in, in looking at sort of the margin progression, yes, the material margin part is, is one thing. There is the, uh, um, let's say, call it OPEX or the, the leverage or the efficiency improvements. I mean, we continue to uh, um, work here on many aspects, uh, you know, throughout the value chain with very, let's say, good projects on the way. I mean, you have the leverage element uh, relating to, let's say, the overall cost. I think we have seen a bit of a step up, although inflation uh, has not uh, uh, gone away. It will also uh, depend a bit on the overall uh, on the overall growth uh, driving here leverage. So that is one element where I think there is uh, obviously uh, upside. Um, and then we have, let's say, the uh, um, MBCC or, or acquisitions, where on the one hand, we will still see a certain element of additional dilution given, uh, let's say, four more months, uh, particularly from a seasonality perspective, um, and, uh, um, not, a, not a strong quarter, the, the, the first one, but at the same time, uh, increasing, uh, you know, synergy uh, contribution uh, overall, and we'll obviously uh, not have uh, uh, most of these one-time costs in, uh, uh, in in twenty in twenty four. So I think there is a, a clear progression. But also here, I think we want to be sort of clear and simple, and not take one or the other uh, out. But uh, um, similarly, as to let's say the top line. Early in the year, I think we'll, we'll drive all the uh, initiatives, but we will then be later in the year also to be a bit more specific what, uh, what that means. Thank you. Morning, it's John Bell at Deutsche Bank. Could you just broaden your comments slightly on raw material costs? What would be your 
base case, admittedly at this early stage, for the year-on-year movement, or perhaps give us some kind of indicative range? Thank you. Yeah, maybe here we have seen a huge uh, increase, of course, but we also noticed that we have a flattening of uh, the raw material cost. Last year, we had some, let's say, uh, support from decreasing uh, input cost, but this has uh, leveled out. So I, I would say going into 24, here we have rather a new plateau that has been established uh, uh, over these uh, three years. And uh, we see also some commodities uh, like cement, for instance, uh, still going up. So uh, the, the the trend to, let's say, reduce slightly has stopped. And it's rather something where we have to be agile in adjusting as it comes. And certain uh, price adjustments are, of course, uh, mandated. We also have uh, non-material inflation cost that uh, also needs to be translated into the pricing uh, uh, strategy. So I would say, say yeah, it is it is on a higher level and it is rather flattish, but always there are uh, exemptions that uh, that we need to to address and uh, not to underestimate the non non material uh, inflation cost that we also have to address. Um, Christian Arnold, Steve, will, um, maybe just following in that. Um, Personnel expenses. I mean, uh, we had an increase in of 150 basis points, um, and you also talked about a one-off. Maybe you can quantify the one-off, and what do you expect for for 24? Are we going to see a further increase in personnel expenses in relation to sales? Yeah. Um, in terms of the the, the personnel cost, I, I commented on let's say the underlying let's say inflation wage inflation in 23, which was around five percent on a on a like for like basis. The uh, the one off that is included is to do with uh, with severance uh, cost uh, on on the integration uh, here. The level is is about 20 million that is included in the in the one off uh, cost uh, um, here uh, for 24. Um, the expectation is that, uh, let's say, wage inflation to some extent will uh, uh, continue, um, probably not quite at the, the level of 5%, but it will also not be back to, let's say, more normal levels, what we typically have across the group, 2 to 3%. I would still think that's going to be a bit more elevated, uh, given the fact that, uh, obviously, uh, this uh, um, there, there is a certain lag uh, particularly in, in some of the European countries uh, in terms of uh, wage inflation. Thank you. And the second question would be on uh, operating free cash flow generation, which was great last year. Big swing factor here was networking capital uh, plus 80 million. Last year was a minus 320, so 400 million swing factor, so to say. Um, for 24, do we have to assume... Uh, normal development of networking capital in line with sales or what do you expect? Yeah, uh, I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, working capital uh, has in the last uh, a few years been a, a big uh, swing factor as you as you call it. I would see um, clearly here continued, let's say, potential uh, in terms of uh, you know optimizing uh, on, on the um, inventory level, for example. Um, um, Big focus is always on, on receivables, also from a risk point of view. I think uh, also here, continued effort. Uh, the payable side, I think an area uh, where, uh, again, there is some improvement. So I would uh, rather see continued improvements of uh, the ratio, the, uh, um, let's say, overall absolute impact. Uh, don't think uh, it will be, again, uh, uh, let's say, an, an absolute positive uh, contribution and uh, but as you say, this will depend on on growth uh, going going forward. Thanks, Martin Fuki from Capital Chevrolet. I have two questions, please. Um, first one is a, an additional question, clarification question on your uh, guidance for 
um, organic growth or sales growth in local currencies. Just wondering, um, based on your comments um, or Thomas's comments regarding raw material prices, what is your expectation for the selling price development in 2024? And, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what kind of uh, what what the implications are for expected volume growth going forward. Because if I remember correctly, in Q1 22, tw- sorry 23, you had um, minus eight percent volume growth. So the comps are getting rather easy now. And um, and if I remember correctly as well, um, volume turned positive in Q4, slightly positive. So is that a trajectory that we're going to continue to see? That's my first question. Yeah, and here, I mean, it's, it's clear we won't have a 22 situation where, where pricing will be the, the, the main contributor. We will uh, see here a minor contribution from pricing. Uh, it is also very clear to us that our, uh, let's say, smart pricing approach needs to stimulate that we can grow on the volume side, safeguarding our material margin, of course. So here, we, we don't want to go excessive. We have launched uh, price increases, selected price increases, but the magnitude is rather minor in, in the overall co- assumption for the, the 6 to 9%. As here, we have to take a balanced approach, and uh, that's uh, you know, clearly volume-driven, not price-driven, if we exclude the acquisition part for the 6 to 9 Okay, and, and historically, your pricing has been at around 1%. Is that a ballpark number that we should reckon with for 24? That's a, that's a good ballpark number, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. My second question is on the synergies. Um, seems to me like uh, the, the synergies you've achieved with the integration of MBC, of the number that pops up in my head is 41 million, seems a little bit larger than what you had anticipated. I thought the guidance was around 25 million or somewhere around there. So um, could you elaborate a little bit on the on the delta, why you were able to achieve the 41 instead of the 25, and what you're expecting for 24? Thanks. Maybe here it is, it's quite simple. I think we have quite significant one-time cost, and each uh, alluded to one of them. You know, with the, with the start of the integration in May, and then... Uh, let's say, working together with the organization over 100 days, we saw, you know, this, we, we can move faster. You know, the 25 millions were our original uh, plan to execute. We saw, why should we delay? You know, and yes, we'll rather take the hit and are blamed this year that the reported EBIT is lower than last year while we spent that, uh, let's say, on making sure that the synergies and the acceleration of the integration are a top priority. And that led then also to, well, let's say, significant achievements already this year, which we, of course, expect and also to deliver in the following years, and that's that's beneficial. So to, do, to your question, you know, we have front-loaded, I would say, the integration uh, purposefully because we saw we can do it, we have the alignment, and we have the meaningful actions, and some of them are really, let's say, high contributor and uh, that changed a bit the, the view on the aggregation of the of the uh, synergies. The guidance oh, on the on the synergies. Yeah, please. Yeah, what do we have? Uh, uh, Eighty to one hundred million um, um, run rate, which is basically um, forty to sixty incremental in twenty four. Thanks. Okay, Schroeder, Alessandro. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Alessandro Poletti, Octavian, thank you for taking my question. Um, You mentioned the interest rates being a bit of a headwind, I think, in America. I wonder if there's a way for you to quantify how big this headwind is and uh, if uh, there is nothing like that similar also in Europe or maybe not in Asia because maybe that's not relevant, but Euro and US. That's uh, that's, a very difficult question and... uh, I wonder how I can answer that, how to quantify how much it would be if we would have, let's say, the interest uh, of before. It's it's not as simple. I mean, we see, of course, that some businesses are super strongly impacted by, by the raise of the interest. Others may be underlying uh, trends like the, the commercial, let's say, the, the office building construction 
has uh, probably nothing to do with the interest rate that that is weak because of a change in uh, in in pattern that uh, that you don't need these buildings these buildings are retuned into apartments uh, so I, I think it's it's more complex than that but it, it's it's clear it is headwind and uh, we see immediately when when the interests are let's say talked down that then uh, there comes immediately uh, to the surface activities that could then be let's say uh, unleashed so it has an impact but i cannot uh, quantify how, how much that would be and then a second one on the automotive side of the business um kind of surprised to hear oh, a lot of optimism for your side at least that's my interpretation uh definitely for for europe um i personally am not very very positive this year, but also in general for EVs, um, particularly the Europeans and Americans, are big troubles there. So why are you so much more optimistic? Look, we had a, we had a terrible time in automotive. The industry was down to 75 million units. But of course, this is an industry that runs on capacity. We are back at 90 million units uh, globally. That's positive. You know, that's kind of, that's healthy. That's, uh, that's what the industry needs. And you also can see it in our numbers that our numbers recovered very nicely in that segment because it is back to, let's say, pre-COVID build rates. That is positive. The transformation and, uh, let's say, the different uh, region or, let's say, the different accounts taking advantage of that, pushing for electrification, that's maybe a little bit less uh, positive, especially when we look at, let's say, the German uh, car industry that is is losing momentum. Uh, the Chinese are gaining a lot of momentum on the on, on the e vehicle side. This is very well noticed, and this is also impacting our automotive business in in Europe going forward. At the same time, we have a very strong organization in China, and in China we work heavily on the battery side with the Chinese OEMs, and we want to expand that furthermore. So, but the industry itself is super challenged. And I would say, yes, some of the traditional uh, OEMs are, are having not yet found the magic key to, to, to pass the way into the future. Besides that, that we have a lot of incentives that are distributed around the electrification. If that stops, you know, the pure cost of the vehicles come to the forefront. And this can also be, let's say, uh, an, uh, and a delay in the expected uh, build-up of the e-fleet uh, in Europe, in North America. In China, not so much. China has a very clear strategy to drive the e-vehicle. One way or the other, they will, they will make it. They will push it, but it's a different, it's a different uh, environment. It's uh, clearly a strategic target of the government to drive that uh, as a leading uh, um, uh, uh, Technology uh, in China. And Good question here. Thank you for taking my question. I have two, please. Um, the first one: Can I go back to uh, U.S. and market 101? So, could you please remind us what is the U.S. and market exposure? Um, so, for example, commercial, infra, residential, uh, manufacturing. And I think did I hear correct that Mike started uh, his com uh, his his uh, section by saying infrastructure he expected to be slightly negative or maintain stable. So, can I get a bit more color on that? And then within that end market. Uh, for residential, could you please remind us what are the main product you sell in residential? Is that more directed to home builders for new build, or is that for uh, via distribution channel for remodeling? So that's the first question. Thank you. Well, there's many questions in one question. <laughs> <laughs> I try my best. But maybe I'll start at, at the end. The 20% the residential that the, I have shown as, as a group average is far lower in, in, in the U.S. than in the rest of the world. It's it's far less than 10% uh, in, in the U.S. And it is, let's say, business that has built up with the big box uh, uh, players. So it is uh, clearly, let's say, family, single family home uh, oriented, uh, multifamily home oriented uh, business. It has a good uh, growth traction, but compared to infrastructure, which is which is a strong uh, uh, lag in the U.S., roofing is a very strong lag in the U.S., uh, commercial is a very strong, uh, and then not to forget the U.S. market is a market with a lot of uh, refurbishment. 
70% of our business in the US is refurbishment, 30% is, is new build. So that's a bit to characterize our US uh, organization. The automotive business that is uh, now also, uh, let's say, back in the region is, of course, a substantial part here, uh, also of the US uh, contribution. But this would be the you know, number one is roofing, then infrastructure, commercial, automotive, and then residential probably being the the, the, the smallest contributor on that scale. Okay, understood. And can you just clarify, did Mike say that he expects infrastructure to be negative or maintain stable? or he I don't, I don't think so, because okay. it is positive. I'll, I'll clarify. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, the second question is a follow-up on the EV-related question. I think even if we believe there will be strong EV growth globally next year, or, or uh, this year, particularly driven by China, I think there's very little doubt that there will be a price war in order to stimulate that demand. Um, and I think that pr pr uh, put a lot of pressure on uh, the automotive, the EV supply chain, particularly actually on the battery side. So can you tell us what are the conversations you're having with your EV battery customers? Are you already feeling the pinch or, you know, you, you, you notice anything in the, in the way they place order and, and, and take inventory? Thank you. Our automotive business is a profitable business. You know, that's like where we are, we have to be profitable. It's one of the most toughest uh, businesses my personal experience, if you come in with nothing relevant for the future, you will be pushed down in your margins, probably even below zero. They don't care. You know? So it is, it is very clear. The push on the, on let's say efficiency on the batteries, the next generation, it's all driven by how can we together as a key supplier with the OEMs bring costs down out of the, the batteries, bring efficiency in. And that conversation is super key to preserve that what we deliver today is not knocked down to a level where you are no longer happy with your, your with your uh, business. So it is it is a business where you have constantly demonstrate that as a prime supplier, as a preferred supplier, you are working with them on their challenge in a very competitive market, and you mentioned it, the price war is out there, not only on the E side, it's, it's uh, in, in every vehicle, uh, it's the, this efficiency and this drive for leanness. I would say we, we stand the steam in the kitchen and we, we, this, is, this is what we have done. It's no different in the e-mobility, uh, but the e-mobility has a bit a faster cycle. This is not the five to ten year cycle. This goes in three to five year cycles. And we have to stay relevant and therefore we invest into innovation. That's why we stay low, uh, uh, close to those uh, OEMs so that we are a preferred uh, source also going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is, uh, sorry to, to interrupt, there are, there are still about 100 people joining online and we have uh, several questions as well from from uh, the whole online people and i'd like to ask here first one cedar eggblom from morgan stanley to come up with her question please and wait until you're on screen uh, before you shoot your question thank you Perfect. We see you. We can't hear you yet. The sound is not yet here. Is it on our side? Uh, see, can you check the sound? Is it the sound all right with you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Basically, Martin tells me here from from the back that the sound is, is turned off, on. Probably in between, we just go uh, with Elodie as well, that is, that is ready. And uh, sorry for, for letting you waiting uh, for, for a moment from JP Morgan. So, um, and we try with this and see if we come back to you as, 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 far, as soon as we have the, the sound ready. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so if we, uh, my first question would be on, on the US, if you don't mind that we come back on this, uh, on the performance there. I think it was a big disappointment uh, last year, and I think you're still a bit cautious in the near term, but we haven't really talked about the near term trends. So it'd be helpful if you could develop a little bit on what has caused the weakness, really, um, what has been the impact of the stocking cycles on your like for like performance in the US. If it was a headwind um, in 23, it will be more of a tailwind this year. Um, and how long do you think this uh, weak performance uh, will last? Like, is it an H1? Do you see a uh, scope for that to, to stabilize at the end of Q2? What's, what's the time frame there? Please. Okay, that's maybe the first one. You know, the Q4 performance uh, has a, quite a, a strong impact from MBCC. MBCC had difficulties in 22 in, in, during the year to, to uh, overcome uh, 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 delivery problems and had a very strong Q4 to catch up. Also increased prices in Q1 this year, which was accelerating, uh, let's say, build up uh, of sales in, in Q4. This has quite a substantial impact. It's roughly 1.5 to 2% of the total uh, U.S. growth that has been negatively uh, impacted by this organic uh, uh, comparison uh, based on the MBCC. Underlying that, Q4 has been kind of similar to, to Q3, so no significant improvement, but also no uh, deterioration in uh, in the in, on the volume side. Uh, going into uh, this year, yes, we expect that we will have some some uplift uh, as we had in the in the roofing business quite a significant destocking element in the first half of uh, uh, 23. At the same time, we just must also notice that uh, the roofing business had outstanding uh, uh, results in 22. 23 has normalized. We saw it also in the second half of the year that the business hasn't, let's say, picked up so much. So I would say underlying we expect in roofing a uh, normal year, so to say, with some uplift from, from the destocking side, but not uh, a major boom like we have seen in, in 22. We should also not uh, be misled by the construction volume in, in, the, US, in the US, which is quite high. Uh, and this is, of course, driven as more new build goes into construction you have a much higher volume in construction than when you traditionally have more on the refurbishment side. We participate on that new build, but the ratio on a new build compared to the total volume that the building or the, 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 the structure builds is, of course, lower than on a refurbishment job where not the whole structure is uh, built, but rather you know the roof is replaced. The waterproofing is upgraded. Uh, this, this is deteriorating a little bit the ratio when you look how much has the construction business grown in the US. Uh, there is a shift in going into reshoring, going into uh, uh, infrastructure, new build. That is, is a, a bit misleading. Nevertheless, you know, we expect the US to, to uh, improve. So this uh, stagnation in Q3, Q4, we don't take as as a, as a baseline for the full year 24. Thank you. Can I just push just a little bit on H1? Would you expect to see a positive, imp like an improvement as soon as H1? Would you, which would we expect positive um, performance on a like for like basis in H1? Positive in volumes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it will be, it will, it will not be positive in volumes because we still have a, and, and uh, a negative volume there. I expect that to improve, but it will still be negative. So we have a roughly, a, let's say, three, four percent negative volume. This will not turn into positive in in uh, in H1, but it will improve. Okay, that's clear. Um, and then can I just have a, a follow up on MBCC? Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I think on the synergies, you were quite clear. 
On integration costs, you had guided, I think, at the CMD about 230 million, and you did already 200 million. So, is it ballpark okay to think 30 million for 24? Yes, yeah. I mean, this, uh, I don't see uh, this to go higher. Um, Thomas uh, mentioned it. I mean, this has been sort of heavily sort of uh, front uh, front loaded in terms of the uh, the activity. Um, so yes, uh, um, that uh, I would see 20 to 30 million in uh, in uh, in 24. Okay, great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. So are we back to Cedar or? Let's try it once again. Yes, <laughs> Cedar. Um, we just take you up and then um, let's check whether we have now. Um, Some sound. <laughs> Same we, we see you, we hear you, we don't hear you, so. Otherwise you text us and then. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. good. Yes. Perfect. Magic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. You would have thought after the pandemic I'd know how to use Zoom. But anyway, um, I just have a question on your margin comments. I'm surprised that you're not more ambitious on gross margins for 24. And the reason I, I think that is ultimately in the fourth quarter, you did 55% gross margin. You're telling us that there's a little bit of tailwind from pricing to think about into 2024, um, that your raw material costs are no longer going down, but I don't think you're giving us an impression that there is a lot of raw material cost inflation coming through. Um, so, so what are we missing in terms of why your gross margin is not closer to the top end of the 54 to 55% range that you'd set, rather than at the bottom end? Um, so that's the one question on gross margins. And then just on um, your EBITDA margin, if we think about the moving parts into next year, you've probably got a 90 basis point tailwind on the fact that your MBCC cost will be a lot lower. You've probably got at least 60 basis points on, on gross margin, then potentially a little bit of operating leverage if we get volume growth in, into the second half of the year. So the question is, is, is the 20% EBITDA um, low end of the range really something that we need to wait for, for the full MBCC synergies to be realized, which is where the current guidance is? Or is that something that we could actually potentially realize in 24 if we get operating leverage, which clearly is, is an open debate at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I was, uh, well, thanks for uh, that uh, challenge, uh, Cedar. I was kind of expecting that. Um, if uh, obviously you look at the progression and I was talking uh, about this, there is these uh, different elements. Um, we also said, um, as you pointed out, that, you know, the 20 to 23 uh, percent, you know, target range uh, is, uh, you know, the target once uh, MBCC um, synergies, uh, you know, have have realized. I don't think uh, you should expect for 2024 20, uh, that we're, you know, at the, uh, the 20 percent uh, all already. Although we're making good progress on 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 the synergy side, uh, but there is, as I was uh, pointing out, I'd say these, I'd say moving uh, parts. There will be uh, an additional. Um, um, incoming dilution uh, due to sort of the full consolidation of the of the 12 months on the material margin side. This is uh, uh, probably uh, a bit a cautious guidance here, um, um, understood. But uh, I think uh, again here there is a level of uh, volatility, uncertainty. We will certainly progress in that uh, direction. Uh, but uh, early in the year, uh, many, uh, let's say, different, uh, you know, factors, uh, also foreign exchange plays a role and so on. But I think we're making clear uh, uh, progress, but uh, I would uh, uh, at the same time also defer um, a more, let's say, clearer uh, guidance then to, uh, to later on in the year. Okay, you're pleased, Cedar. <laughs> Let's go on and um, and have another question from HSBC. Breaches, please. Uh, um.
Hi. Uh, can you hear us? Yes. Anyway. Super. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, firstly, um, just to understand your uh, strategy for emerging markets, um, it's great that you are talking about um, um, uh, there is a significant potential in India, and uh, we do see that in China already. But when you look at uh, the penetrations, uh, can you give us uh, an idea how the business kind of evolves? Can, can for example, you have put in a plant in east of India. If you were to put um, five, ten plants in, in probably one year, two years, is that something a possibility you could do it? Because I'm just understanding if there is significant growth, what is stopping you to put four or five plants just or just putting one plant may take, I mean, the cost-wise is not high. I just wanted to understand how, how you're thinking behind getting into a market and growing that. And uh, the second question is more about China. Um, we do see that the um, uh, things have not kind of improved uh, much. So distribution, you had growth. Um, if you could give us a little more color about uh, 2024, uh, what you expect in terms of distribution and project segment. Sorry, if this question is not already question answered. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. And in India, I think we we do have a footprint with 12 factories at the moment. We have a significantly increased our footprint with the MBCC transaction. We want to move fast. It's a, it's an economy on the move. And you are right, you know, go little one by one is probably not the right recipe. So here it's very clear we want to cover more of the market uh, organically but also uh, inorganically, that would be uh, an, an exciting, let's say, bolt on to to further tap into that market potential. But we have a we have a solid uh, footprint in India, and yes, we make further investments, uh, organic and inorganic, uh, as we see that uh, here. Let's say time is of essence. This is uh, fast moving. There are local competitors that are also ready to take advantage. So we we are up to that, and we will use all the means that we can, uh, let's say, um, mobilize to get uh, ahead and uh, win market shares in India. In China, our distribution business in China, which has been very resilient uh, despite the, the the residential uh, downturn, we expect also to deliver strong growth in in 24. We expect uh, double-digit growth uh, plus minus uh, from that uh, unit alone. But we also expect that the, the more traditional Zika business will benefit from a clear drive towards more qualitative um, uh, construction, uh, given the five-year plan of the government addressing, let's say, some of the weak spots of the past build-up uh, of infrastructure with, let's say, with specifications which are not up to what they should be. So I think we will benefit uh, as a clear leader in, in, in uh, influencing the GB standards uh, in, in, in China for, for new construction. And this uh, gives me also confidence as, as one of the only global players being active in China that we can influence and benefit from, let's say, the the uh, uh, upgrading of the standards and construction uh, quality overall. So both the distribution as well as the, the more direct business, I, I, I see uh, good opportunities. But China is in, uh, let's say, in different uh, mood at the moment. You know, the government tries to stimulate. It hasn't yet found the magic key to unlock uh, former growth uh, patterns. So that is probably still something which will prevail in 24. But in the longer run, you know, we, we, we are also in China for China and uh, we contribute uh, uh, with our means, with that, with our R&D center that we have built, with our connections to the, to the specifiers in, uh, in creating here also a business uh, uh, base for future growth. Can I ask a supplementary on China, please? Um, would you be able to help us the split between uh, distribution and the uh, project segment business there? Distribution business uh, with its great uh, growth tractionary has uh, clearly surpassed the direct business. So it is uh, quite sizable and it is dominant uh, in our in our 
uh, aggregation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, for everybody for waiting. Uh, we still have more than 180 people now uh, joining online and, and we have a lot of questions. We can't take all the questions. Uh, sorry um, for that. But uh, Arno Lehmann uh, from Bank of America, please uh, as well join us with your question. <clears throat> Very good. Can you hear me? Yep, Here and see you, yes. Excellent. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, or good afternoon, actually, now. Um, three questions, if I may. Hopefully, they're quite brief. Just coming back on your margins in Asia Pacific and the global business in the second half, very strong delivery, much higher than in the first half of both divisions. Uh, was there any one-offs or do you think if that's, that was the underlying business, do you think that's sustainable into the first half and, and, the 20, and 2024? Uh, my second question is on uh, wage inflation. Uh, can you discuss, I think you discussed your view like up to 5%, but in the, in the Q4 and the second half, that was the underlying wage inflation and what was the uh, integration of, of MBCC? Um, uh, and lastly, can you give us an indication of the of the tax rate for 2024? I think it came down quite a bit in 23, but there was effect from the various various moving parts. So guidance for 24 would be helpful. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Um, thanks, Arno, for the question. Let me try to address them one by one here on uh, the uh, performance of uh, Asia Pacific global business. No, there is no. Um, one-offs included here in, in the second half year. It's uh, an ongoing, let's say, improvement uh, progression um, here, as we have seen sort of across uh, um, here the board of the business, particularly in uh, in global business, uh, you know, having been challenged in the two years before on various fronts, uh, let's say volumes, uh, um, margin, also taking a bit longer to establish uh, the pricing uh, level again also taken here the opportunity to improve and optimize. So that's uh, an ongoing um, um, improvement uh, uh, of the of the business. And also in Asia Pacific, there is no uh, um, one-offs uh, in, included. On the on the wage inflation, um, I commented uh, on the uh, um, effect uh, that, that on the full year. Um, 23 um, second half of Q4 was not uh, was not marginally different to to the five uh, uh, percent um, going uh, forward. I said I would still uh, assume a certain elevation of that level, but uh, um, most likely a bit lower than uh, than the five percent uh, uh, overall. And then on the on the tax rate, uh, yes, there was this one-off um, um, effect. If you look at Underlying expected tax rate without any um, one-offs uh, um, for 24. We're sort of looking at uh, 23 to 24 percent. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arno. Good. Further questions here in the room? Sandro? Yes, we will do that. Okay, Dominic, so we are at the end. Thank you a lot uh, for, for joining us uh, for this uh, uh, discussion here, the presentation of our results 23, but also our expectation for 24. I sense you, you get the, the feeling that we are always optimistic, but we are also cautious that we can't make the world uh, the way we would like it to be. It is a, it is a uh, still very volatile environment, good trends offset by, by not so good trends. 
overall, we believe we in Zika, we have the, the luxury and we have the, 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 the future in our hand. The destiny is in our hands. We can create and we will also in 24 drive towards uh, the goal, delivering top line growth and delivering over proportional bottom line growth. That's our DNA. That's where we go up for. And I look forward to our next uh, interaction then uh, in summer when we will uh, share then again the full set of numbers. In between, we will have our uh, Q1 uh, uh, top line uh, communication and uh, and uh, we can then further elaborate. I look forward for those that are sitting here to have a, a quick bite together. And for the others, I might see you next week in London or somewhere else on this planet in the near future in Japan. You are all invited to come to Japan, of course. It will be exciting uh, to spend some uh, moments there, understanding better the nation and especially the Japanese markets. So thanks for joining us uh, today and uh, looking forward uh, to the next time to, to interact. Thank you.